Okay, welcome again. Um, in the last talk I gave, I had too much information to give to you. And in this talk, I have too little. Um, <laughs> and I think that's quite important. I think the fact that I've got too little is actually a very important sign of what we've got to do next. And hopefully in the, the panel afterwards, some of those elements will come out. So I'll be talking a lot slower in this one to fill up the time. <coughs> Okay, so green chemistry, how much of it's occurring in South Africa? Um, I, so I found that a, quite a difficult question to answer, and so the first thing I did, I went to the, to the databases um, in this one, Scopus, which you can look up the number of papers that are published in any particular area. Um, but before I got there, I just wanted to kind of have a kind of set the scene a bit and get some, some sort of more macroscopic information. And as I said in the previous talk, we've got population growth. And in particular, the area where there's the most population growth through increasing longevity mostly um, is Africa and parts of the Middle East. The rest of the world is sort of further along the curve. They started to slow down. Um, but this is an area, obviously, with increased population. I think that they're talking about, by the end of the century, Africa will have about 3 billion people, which is uh, almost triple of what it is now. So obviously, if that's happening, we must be putting lots and lots of, of chemical companies down on the ground. That must be happening all over Africa. But it's not. <laughs> Okay, so this is capital, uh, chem, uh, chemical capital spending. I pulled this out of a, an EU report, and uh, they've got two dates here, 2007 to 2017, to give a, an indication of the shift. Um, and there's, it's fairly consistent, or dropped off a bit in Europe, North America. Uh, South America's increased a bit. China has massively increased its... its um, expenditure on, on capital. So that's why, you know, as you see, so many products are coming out of China. Uh, India's also gone up, but not nearly as much as that. Um, and parts of Asia, obviously South Korea, and that kind of thing, they've also increased their capacity. I think we sit somewhere in here, rest of the world. So we need to do something about that. If we're going to have a large population, we're going to have to have a big chemicals industry. Otherwise, we'd just be importing everything. So this is, this is one area of concern. Uh, and to get there, we have to have lots of R&D. Because, yeah, you can buy some of the technology, but you can't buy all of it. And um, just going back to what had been said in some of the other talks, is if we are going to export things, there's going to be lots of trade barriers based on environmental <coughs> considerations. So we have to have cutting edge green technology to be able to sell things to the rest of the world. So obviously we must be doing tons and tons of research, and the answer is not really. So again, um, well, the spending on <coughs> R&D has gone up <coughs> across the world, even, even where they're not putting as much capital down, uh, North America, Europe, uh, Brazil's doubled it from a very low base, <coughs> India's gone up, China's gone up um, about six times almost. Um, we're somewhere down here. We're not doing enough research by a long shot. And this is just this is overall R&D spending. It's not, just, it's not just green chemistry. It's the whole thing. So we've got a, a big challenge ahead of us. Okay, so I went to look at Scopus and I pulled up the number of publications, documents by country or territory, and at the moment China's edged out, uh, is in the lead, uh, USA is next, India's rapidly behind, uh, Japan, then you've got uh, quite a number of, of the European countries coming in with a few other ones slotted in here and there. Um, we're about the third group down, and I've colored South Africa in there, um, and we're sort of a bit below Denmark, Hong Kong, Mexico, Czech Republic's in there, Austria. We're a little bit above uh, Pakistan, Israel, Argentina, uh, Thailand, and Finland. So it's, it's, not, it's not bad, um, but we could be doing better. I divided the the number of public, or the, uh, trying to correlate the ratio of publications uh, to people in the country, uh, China's 
doing, to, we're getting about 400 or so, China's about 570, so it's not so bad. We're, per capita, we're not terribly far behind. Um, so that's, that's one good sign. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of publications across the board, and that's because, in, as in you saw in the previous talk, there's lots of different components to green chemistry, and not everybody puts green chemistry as being their topic. So I started um, looking at other options, uh, how, to, how to dig for it before. But here, yeah, sorry, this, this, before we get there, this is uh, green chemistry publications where it's used as a keyword, and you get universities like KwaZulu-Natal. There's a nanosciences African framework, <laughs> Uh, Stellenbosch, uh, Northwest, and Witz were the, the top ones on that kind of list. Um, and there's about like 70, 70 papers a year. I couldn't find uh, the patents on that. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming about one patent for every, every 100 publications. Okay. All right, yeah, so, what, so I said... There's a lot of different things, so I, and the other day I had to put a slide together, Green Sustainable Chemistry for, for Vits, and I put, ended up putting more and more people on because everybody was doing a little bit to do with that, and even this, I could, extend, I could put another three or four people on there quite easily, if not more. So then I thought, let's go back and start looking at which other subjects are there. So I mentioned previously catalysis is a, is a core area of, of uh, green chemistry, and just the, the number of catalysis papers by themselves exceeds that for, for the ones listed under green chemistry as a whole. So obviously, if you put all of these together, you're going to get quite a few more papers out of it. Um, here you've got groups like uh, Rhodes, um, Witz, uh, quite high numbers. Uh, Cape, U University of Cape Town, we'll come back to, there's a, a network involved with this. Um, biocatalysis, my area in particular, uh, there's about up to about 30 papers per year. Universities like Stellenbosch, Cape Town, Free State's involved. Uh, it's most of them, University of Pretoria, UKZN. So it's quite spread all over the country as well. And again, we had a we, we tried to stimulate that. We set up a network a few years ago. Uh, sustainable chemistry, I looked that one up as well. Um, again, they're looking at about 25 papers per year. Um, Northwest universities, particularly there, UKZN, WITS again. So a lot of the, a lot of the uh, major research universities are covering a number of different topics. So in each of those, you can see that there's um, an increase. They've all gone from, uh, in all of these topics, uh, generally very low numbers, around about 2,000. And each of them by that now has, has gone up by a factor of, of 20 or 100 or more. So it shows that we are doing more and more research in those kind of areas. OK, another one I looked up uh, from the more engineering side is life cycle analysis. So that's where you look at a product all the way from its kind of uh, uh, feedstocks, often all the way to its either um, uh, recycling or if it's, it's dumped somewhere, you know exactly how much is, is used up, how much energy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, quite a key um, research area. And those papers have increased dramatically over the, year, over the years as well. So across the board, there seems to be a lot more green chemistry research going on in the country. Okay, so you got a, an idea of, of that. You know some of the universities involved in doing it. It doesn't capture everything, so who's involved? Okay, uh, public stakeholders. So there's DST or DSI, which is Cunningly changed its name in the last few days, I believe. Okay, which has confused confused me. But uh, yeah, so McClory is in the in the audience here. So uh, I know that he's run a number of um, of green chemistry workshops to, to get things started a few years ago. Um, uh, Dr. Russia Muse uh, is involved in the industrial bioeconomy, which overlaps with the green chemistry uh, by pumping in certain uh, components into that. Um, IDC has also been involved in some of these discussions, uh, particularly the last last year they were they were here uh, to discuss things like that. DTI, you saw that uh, Gerard was here and presenting that they so they're involved. CSIR, NRF funds a number of projects in in green chemistry. 
the Water Research Commission um, obviously is involved kind of peripherally perhaps with this. Cheetah, I'll mention that in a moment, and the Department of Environmental Affairs will have some, some projects running on that. Okay, so in particular the CSR has been involved over the years in uh, a number of green projects. Um, I was involved in some of them a few years ago, but across the board they've been trying to develop some of those from uh, early stages. And they're the hosts for this, this conference. Well, um, now the South African uh, Chemical Institute, SACI, which is the kind of professional body for for all the uh, chemistry researchers. They've recently opened up a green chemistry uh, division. And so therefore there's obviously science of that. And that's spread across a number of universities, Rhodes, UKZN, uh, CSR, DST is involved in the University of the Western Cape. So again, we're seeing a spread of other people involved. Um, and Cheetah. So Cheetah is the CETA which is involved for the chemical industry. And they've, they've indicated they've got two big areas of concern that they want to develop schools for, for the uh, future of industry. One's the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, that's actually quite important for green chemistry as well, because you can use um, machine learning to predict how to make uh, savings and improve processes. And the other one specifically is green chemistry. So again, Cheetah, which is the, uh, the, the school supplier or school trainer, is aligned with this as well. Okay. Uh, Luzon in front here. So he's, uh, he's um, standing for the Chemical and Allied Industries Association. And that's the association which covers all the companies, or a great many of the companies in chemistry in South Africa. And they are very keen on green chemistry. Every year they've got a number of days where they support various aspects of green chemistry. <coughs> and they have something called the Responsible Care Initiative. Um, and that is something which uh, has elements which match onto green chemistry and where they bring in the chemical industry to uh, take on certain um, uh, sort of self-regulating uh, actions where they then will reduce waste, try to be as most efficient as possible, reduce toxicity, etc., etc. Um, and so they've got a goal just by next year, which is fairly close, uh, to minimise significant adverse impacts on human health and the environment. Um, and basically, the, the chemical industry sends in reports every year to say, well, they've managed to reduce water consumption uh, or reduced energy per tonne of product produced. So again, there's alignment there. Uh, and then we have uh, the very important uh, National um, um, Cleaner Production Centre, uh, which is, or oh, you've, Faith and Tanya have been running this very effectively. Thank you. This is the, the second year I've been with you and going that, and I think you're making a lot of traction here. And they've been bringing in, as you heard earlier, with uh, Dr. Steer comes to talk about bringing in um, teaching or course material from Yale and bringing in uh, Unido and Geff, or Jeff rather, on this. Okay. And then there's the, the, the most important part is the industry itself. There's no point doing research and having all these alignments if you don't have the industry. Uh, ACI, I think there's going to be a member of ACI sitting on this panel. I know that ACI does have uh, a lot of uh, programs in for green chemistry. I've been discussing stuff with them recently. Uh, Omnia, um, I know that company less. I know that they are concerned about global warming and they've got it up on their website. Uh, Cecil has also got a number of programs in. Um, there's a lot of international companies working in South Africa as well. Uh, DuPont, Dow, and uh, COVID, um, Corteva. Corteva is the old Dow uh, DuPont agricultural chemical companies have been, re have been merged together into this one. Ivonic and BASF, and I've probably left off uh, quite a number of other ones there. Um, they're all international, so they, most of them have um, their own kind of green chemistry or environmental programs. 
Another one which is which is local um, is quite important is the pharmaceutical industry, but there's not much pharmaceutical production in the country. It's mostly repackaging. So I don't think that they have, um, at the moment, concerns about green chemistry, although if they go into, go into production, they will need to have some kind of technologies around that. Um, and then quite an important set of companies are those which are involved in agro-processing, pulp and paper, and the sugar industry. And those are important because they, they possess the carbon stock. If we're going to stop using uh, renew, uh, the old um, fossil fuels, we're going to have to use renewable carbon, and they are the, those are the kind of companies that possess it in large quantities. So they are probably the, the future of um, much of the chemical industry. And then at the bottom, I've got small, medium, and micro enterprises. Those are incredibly important. I can't easily put a list of those there because I don't know all of them. And the ones I do know have usually forced myself or my colleagues to, to sign agreements of non-disclosure. So um, it's, it's, we can't list them all at this point. But there are uh, actually a vast number of those uh, small companies out there. All right. And there's also. Uh, Business interest, there's actually a green business guide um, which captures some of this as well. So all the way through, we see there's lots of different entities which are involved in green chemistry. OK. So we've seen how much is happening. We know who's involved, what is happening. OK. So I fished this is one off of this is uh, this is Deirdre Penfold, who's the I think maybe the he's still the executive of uh, Kaya, okay, and she'd listed a number of projects down here. A lot of them seem to be linked to the um, I'll mention this in a moment the Biocatalysis Initiative, but there's I think a few others there. Um, there is I think this only captures a small number of projects there. Um, I also picked up that the uh, NRF is funding um, a green chemistry project at Nelson Mandela University. I don't know the contents of it. Um, the DST, sorry, DSI, yes, uh, I should change that on the slide. Uh, they've got a biorefinery initiative has also been, been set up. Uh, the NRF has up to now been funding Sea Change. Now, Sea Change is a network of um, research groups who are looking at catalysis. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the, the funding has run out for that, which is a great pity because I think that Sea Change drove a lot of the connections which are um, pulling all of the people involved in catalysis together. So if there's anybody from the NRF here today, please reconsider that. So this one is a network of biorefinery groups. This is catalysis groups. And the DS DSI also has a biocatalysis initiative that they've been funding over about five years. And that includes, again, includes a network of, of researchers, um, which to a certain extent feed into the same, uh, same output. OK. All right, so those are the kind of research projects that are out there. But it's only, I think it probably only captures a small amount of them. Um, and then I've got some, some examples of green chemistry and industry. I, they're not nearly enough, and I don't know all of them. And one thing you see is I don't have enough information on the, things like the mining industry as well. Uh, it's, it's very much out of my area. So maybe in the session afterwards, some people can give me some enlightenment on that. All right, so um, my career started out in the leather industry doing research there, and a lot of that involved uh, sodium sulfide being pumped out. And people who have lived in Pretoria for a long time would remember the smell of the tannery. Um, I'm not sure if the tannery is still there. They may have moved out of, out of town, but basically they shifted over to uh, using a whole load of enzymes to break down uh, the protein and remove the hair instead of using nearly as much sodium sulfide, and that made the process a lot greener. So that was uh, probably a fairly early win uh, in the country. Um, another big one, and a lot of people don't think this is being biocatalysis, but it's the, the conversion of maize into sugars. So most of your um, 
uh, most of the cool drinks and a lot of the beer products, confectionaries, everything has, has got glucose in it. And most of the glucose in this country is made through uh, breaking down of starch. And um, I don't know exactly what percentage, but I think the majority of this 670,000 tons of maize every year is converted into corn syrup using a couple of enzymes to do that. And again, that was a very green process because they were previously using uh, strong acids. Um, they generate a lot of salt afterwards. They produced a fairly poor product. And this, is, this has dramatically improved it. Um, there's another uh, sugar product which involves an enzyme, um, which is uh, high fructose syrup. Uh, I think in the USA they use an enzyme to convert it from glucose to the fructose, whereas I think in South Africa they probably use invertase, but I can't find the information on that. So invertase taking the, um, the sugar cane and, and using an enzyme to, to cleave that. Again, it's a replacement of a, a previous uh, strong acid process. Uh, this is a, a very good example. Uh, this is a bulk product, uh, acrylamide. It's produced by Senmin, which is one of the ACI companies. And they've got a, an organism which converts acrylonitrile to acrylamide. And that's then used in the mining industry and for uh, water treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, as you can see, it's a very large scale process. And again, because they're, used of, um, because they're using enzymes, which is very selective, uh, they're getting to 99.99% to yield, space time yields of 400 grams per litre per hour, which is quite phenomenal, and 700 grams per litre product, which is, which is quite amazing. Okay, and they, the reason why, again, this used to be based on an acid or an alkali type process, which was run at, at Cecil. Cecil decided to pull out of it, but this, this, um, this process using a, an organism was far more efficient. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure if Dr. Steen comes here, but I mentioned this before. Um, this has been published, so I can talk about this one, where they developed a process uh, to make a fragrance fixative. It's called Ambrox. Uh, the original stuff comes out of uh, what appears to be um, the beaks of, of uh, large squid, which are then eaten by whales and then thrown up. So there's not a lot of it available. <laughs> Um, so once people worked out this was a useful material, they could then um, synthesize it, but that took, a lot, it took eight steps. And Dr. St uh, Dr. Steenkamp found a process to do it in two steps, using two green uh, steps. First off, using an, a microorganism, so be therefore biocatalysis, and then zeolite, which is a cat catalytic process. And so that, that was a very successful technology. And uh, so we've, bet between a number of us, we've done quite a few of these technologies over the years. Okay, this is another one which we, uh, one of my colleagues at Vitz has come up with, um, basically cashews. There's a lot of it, um, there's a lot of cashew shells generated uh, in Africa. Uh, this is the cashew apple and the shells inside that. And if you break it up, you can get a whole bunch of aromatic compounds. And we can show that one of them can absorb uh, sunlight in the same kind of region as, um, as various uh, sunblocks. We don't know if it could be used on people yet, but it can. It is definitely in the right kind of region. We have to be tested out. Um, but that's that was. Um, a very useful product. It can be used also probably in plastics and things like that. And that's got a whole uh, enormous amount of attention just for that one thing over the last... That was a list of um, websites that it appeared on because people got onto it and one, one green chemistry thing has got us a lot, has got us more uh, news time than just about anything else we've done in our school for the last 10 years. So, green chemistry is big news. So, if you want to produce, if you want to promote your company, or your university, or your institution, whatever, go into green chemistry. Okay. So this was a joint one uh, between us, uh, Tanzania, and Germany. Okay. So what next? Okay. So this was uh, by two members of the uh, Saki Green uh, Chemistry um, Group or, or um, committee, and they put together a few comments which I think were quite apt, and I'm going to just go back to them. Uh, the first thing is 
I know very little. I've tried to present something here to show you what's happening, but in depth I know very little what's happening in a lot of places. Um, as we were just discussing uh, earlier, um, is that from the industry side, the industry's got three considerations. Is Number one, if, um, if they come up with a new green chemistry process, if they're not patented, they're not going to tell you about it. So it's going to be secret, so we won't know about it here. Um, a second bit, if, if they've got a lot of waste, it's now going to be, um, and they can't deal with it, and they're coming to ask for help, that's an embarrassment. <laughs> Okay, and if they're researching it, they obviously don't want other companies to know, so they're going to limit what they're telling anybody. So basically, we only know a tiny amount of what companies have, have done, apart from when they advertise it, often long after the process has been developed. Um, but I think Kaya can assist with us in getting at least um, some kind of information on that. <coughs> a green chemistry network should be formed, um, and maybe that's what Saki could do. The more that we talk to each other, the more we'll be able to transfer information across. And I think that there's just a lack of a lack of communication in this area. Uh, public awareness, and this is uh, what Dr. Steenkamp was talking about earlier, and incorporating green issues into life orientation curriculum, for instance. Um, I think some bits are there, but not not enough. Existing platforms uh, and the DSI Science Week and things like that. Disseminating information on existing university courses. It's actually very hard to find. There's, um, I think there's 18 BSc courses in the country, and I don't think any of them, when I typed in green chemistry, none of them popped up as being green, even though we found out that many have got green chemistry elements or even sections of green chemistry uh, in it. None of them popped up, so nobody knows about it. Engaging with the industry through short courses, targeting different industries to demonstrate green approaches, so we don't know with industry, would industry be interested in some short courses on green chemistry? And I think they would like that kind of feedback. Um, we need to do applied research, or more of it, to assist industry um, to reduce waste and lower the carbon footprint. That's, that's obvious to us. Coordination of activities in green chemistry with a flagship project. So basically, um, we, we should probably be pulling a lot more groups together so that they're not all duplicating what they're doing and they can actually feed into each other and give each other better results out of that. Uh, so I think to a certain extent, there's a, a fair amount of government money has been put into green chemistry, but it's not being used as efficiently as possible because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing to a large extent. Um, incentives for green chemistry should be offered in the form of awards, um, um, and to bring in funding for students to, to attend green chemistry conferences, things like that. Um, I read a book recently on the, I don't know if you've uh, been following up on the, the space race at the moment, where you've got SpaceX and you've got Virgin Atlantic and things like that. All of, the, all of these companies that have been sprung up, they were kind of in, initiated by something called the, uh, what is it, the, the uh, X Prize. So somebody put some money up and everybody got interested, and so that's what generated all that interest. Maybe some prizes here would, would generate a lot more interest in driving green chemistry. It doesn't have to be a lot of money. It just has to be something that's going to get people's in, uh, imagination going, and then often investment follows that. And also this Department of Environmental Affairs should be in, involved with these things as well. Okay, so I think that what they did is captured much of what we need to, to do. Um, and uh, Kaya, again, ref I refer back to the Responsible Care Initiative, uh, its commitment to sustainability. Um, they say basically there's no incentives uh, for large companies to switch to green or bio-based products at the moment. So again, this is, a, this is somewhere where the government could get involved. <coughs> um, and maybe, maybe looking at the tax credits and stuff now, maybe, this is, uh, maybe that does start to go in that kind of direction. Uh, large industries should be focused on switching to green alternatives. Uh, one of the problems with that is that, there's, as we saw there, there's not been much in the way of new industrial capital investment. It's hard to change an existing process. Uh, it's much easier to do it for new processes, but there's not been as much investment as there should be in South Africa in uh, new, new stuff on the ground. Okay. 
And this is quite important. It suggested that industry growth should be driven by targeting SMMEs. And that's something that I think that we've seen as well, is that smaller companies can contest and adopt new technologies and then possibly uh, either grow or be absorbed by larger companies once their technology has been improved. So really, I think that the growth of the chemical industry in South Africa could be driven by, uh, by supporting SMMEs and developing a lot of them. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, thank you very much. So I'd just like to show you a couple of pictures off, uh, off the net, but this is, this is the future of, of the chemical industry. Okay. Thank you very much.